And thank you very much for inviting me. Although I have been lecturing for many years, I have seldom been as nervous as I am today. Uh, because I feel it's quite cheeky of me to come and talk to you about digital competence in adult education in Germany. I mean, you're top of the tops. So, and, and what I have heard today confirms it. Although, I must confess, there was a little bit of schadefreude in me. Uh, when, when you didn't manage the video, I thought, I'm, I'm very thankful for that, Celia. It was very nicely done of you. <laughs> it restored my confidence and also confirmed me on my impression about why it is often so difficult to get teachers, especially the dinosaurs like me, to really take in digital tools in, in the classroom because you need to be as confident as Celia is as a person to, to, to cope with something like that. And if you are in a classroom where maybe the, the participants are not even extremely motivated and they tend to think that uh, uh, I, I couldn't be bothered with this learning and everything and something like that happens, so teachers avoid it. It, it was really uh, a practical example of something of what we are going to talk about. Now, um, a, a word of warning. My PowerPoint is here to remind me of what I am to say. It doesn't make any sense to you later. I am a little bit anarchistic with PowerPoints. I refuse to use a lot of time on PowerPoints. They're just my notes. But let's see if we can do something with this. So just a little bit about the European Basic Skills Network, which the DVV is a member of, and we're very proud of this. Um, it is a policy level network. What we want to do is to contribute to better policies, specifically in the area of basic skills. Now, we could use an hour on definitions, what is basic skills. We have defined it for practical purposes as something of a smaller scope than what the European Commission established 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, we say it is about literacy, numeracy, communication in the language of the country, which means language for immigrants but not foreign languages for the others. We don't really get into that as yet. And very much digital competence. And we do use the term digital competence simply to identify an issue, although I perfectly agree with your point, uh, Professor Keres, about why we should talk about having the basic skills you need in a digital society. We are a network of policymakers, ministries, governmental institutions, and what we call policy providers. And then again, I'm going to refer to your talk. We really need to think of ourselves as policy providers, wherever we are as practitioners of adult learning. In the network, the, poli the policy providers are represented by umbrella organizations like a TVB or research institutions or teacher training institutions. So it is at a certain level and the teacher is not there, but they are represented through them because we need to really get to where the problems and issues are and where the solutions can be created and influence policy. And one of my constant themes through the years that I have worked with adult learning is to tell the teachers, please do get involved in everything that is going on digitally. Oh, I'm not very interested and I will soon be retired. Uh, sorry, <laughs> you do need to get involved because you know 
how things need to be transformed. And too often, we have left the digital development to technocrats. Not in your case, because you have created two fantastic platforms that are extremely pedagogical, but mostly in other places in Europe and the world. So what we do is to exchange, very often informally, exchange experience, help each other, send uh, documents uh, that, and examples. And we have all been looking at your examples extremely uh, carefully. So there is, there is mutual learning. Another thing um, is that we are we have been part of the EPALE consortium from the start. You all know about the electronic platform for adult learning in Europe. Challenges, I will say no more, um, but is a, can be a powerful tool. And because of our involvement there, we are now creating with the EPALE team uh, a sort of OER collection called the Capacity Building Series which is related to the newest recommendation of the Commission, the Upskilling Pathways Initiative for Adult Learning. And you know, it's about basic skills and accreditation and guidance and, and getting pathways for the adult. And as one of my friends said, and it's pathways that shouldn't have any dead end. <laughs> so let's create pathways that really take you somewhere. And in, in this connection, because many European countries are now creating policy for basic skills, something like your literacy decay, but something that should be really stable. Uh, we have realized that when they need to integrate other stakeholders, and that is also the case for digital inclusion in general, it's not the quest a question for the Ministry of Education. It's not a question only for the Ministry of Employment or Work or social affairs or health, many stakeholders need to be involved. So we need to inform these stakeholders about the whole issue of basic skills and why they need to be involved. And to do that, we are recycling existing documents and videos and creating new interviews and so on to create collections of open educational resources. Again, this is digital education, but for stakeholders. Uh, so, so that we inform about themes and digital tools and digital inclusion is one of the themes we are going to treat. But more about this in the workshop for those of you who come then. Now, I'd like to. I know. I know this conference is about digital skills or digital approach to adult learning, but I'd like for a moment to take. A much wider, no, for a moment is a lie, it's probably going to be all through it. Um, a wider, a wider view of this. It's not only, what concerns me is not only what uh, digital tools and media uh, can do for education and how they should be integrated. What I'm thinking of is what adult education needs to do for digital inclusion. And that means our target group has become the whole country, not only those who are seeking learning. Everybody needs to be digitally included. And unless you are maybe 12, 13, you're already in trouble because it's already running away from you. And yesterday I read something in a Norwegian newspaper that said that it's a lie that there are uh, digital natives, that the children are digital natives. I'm a grandmother. I have a grandchild who is two years old and knows how to start the video she wants to see. You could think he's a digital native, but what comes more or less natively to them, they learn it as they learn the language, is the skills to make it work, but not the understanding not the critical attitude, not the safety rules, we know that, not the fact that you shouldn't take pictures of you naked and put it on the social media. They are not native to that. 
So there is an enormous scope for adult education outside the people who actually seek our courses. So there's, there's a lot why we need it. We need it in private life. Public services are becoming digital per default. The more advanced the country is, the more this happens. But the sort of inclusion that should come with it is not happening. You know, Estonia is top of the class when it comes to, to uh, functioning uh, skills in, in, digital, in the digital world. They tell me that there is quite a considerable percentage of the population who are not coping because it has become so digital without really spreading the learning that needs to come with it. Democratic development is based nowadays on access to digital media. But actually it is also, as, as you were saying also, Professor Keres, it's also endangered by the digital media unless we develop this critical attitude. I have friends, I'm originally from Spain and I work in Norway, so I have reconnected through social media. It has some good social effects. Through social media, I have reconnected with a whole group of my schoolmates, ladies of my advanced age, who chat now every day as if we were 14. And they keep putting things on the chat that I think immediately Mm -hmm. And they are all in Barcelona. They put things about Catalan politics. And I Google, and five minutes later, I tell them that was fake news. And they consider me a guru because I can Google. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 you, you think it's, it's a joke because anybody can Google. No, no, anybody can put something on the search line of Google. But what to put is a skill. It's like searching for books in a library. Some of us didn't manage when we were 20, now it's in Google. So for democratic development, we need to teach the whole popula population we haven't started. For individual and social welfare, senior people are going to have their social contact very much through social media, but we need to teach them. It is coming for continuous employment. In Norway now, we are talking about uh, courses for basic skills to um, help all adults in working age maintain a healthy and steadfast to the work life. In other words, if you're unemployed, it should be because you want to. But, uh, and how do you do that? It has a lot to do with learning a new way of working and it's coming into all workplaces. So everybody needs to be included, not only our learners, not only the immigrants, not only those who need the literacy that you have created such good platforms for, but how do we search for the others? And it is, of course, for lifelong learning also. Now, notice that I have put the inclusion. We had an online discussion on digital inclusion on Nepal last week. And one of the, the, the areas that came up was uh, but is this all about people learning how to adapt or should the digital revolution adapt to people? And there was this quotation, inclusion is not a strategy to help people fit into the systems and structure that exist. It's about transforming the systems and the structures so that everybody can fit in. Now, can we do that with digital development? I am not sure. It may be a road to utopia. But in, if we, at least as policy 
providers. Keep thinking about it. Keep thinking about how to make it accessible to everybody, how to create, it may be something as easy as making sure that you can always get a, recorded, a recording of what you're reading in case reading is difficult for you as yet. So wide access is a policy in many countries and it should really apply to everything, to try to make it really accessible uh, for people who have not yet learned so much. Maybe a topic, but I mean, adult, adult teachers have always been dreamers. So we can continue dreaming. What we know as adult teachers is that the most important thing is to put the learner at the center. But who is the learner? I know that I, I, I read what was explained this morning about those two magnificent, magnificent platforms that you have created and that it was for a very diverse type of learner. Yes and no, because uh, the, the first one, which was for basic skills, they, they had already, it was people with low qualifications, you sort of have an idea of what they want. And especially for migrants, they are extremely diverse, but they have something in common. They are learning German. So, but when, when you want to put the learner at the center and the learner can be anybody, we do have a challenge. And the challenge comes again from that digital skills are double are, are a dichotomy wherever you look at them because they are a magnificent tool and we've been talking about it today as a tool for learning that needs to be integrated yeah perfect and then we we really should more or less forget the word and just consider that learning today has a digital element but what if you think of what I was saying a moment ago, that we have an enormous amount of people in the country who don't, everybody needs learning, but they don't think they need further learning. But what they need is a digital competence, not only the digital skills, but the competence, knowing how to, how to live in this digital society today. So we need to identify and yet think of all the skills as an integrated whole. But we need to separate and identify and individualize the different skills. There is also another reason for this, and it is that nowadays we're experiencing in many countries that the digital need that the people experience is a motivator and is an eye-opener for other skills they also lack and they were not aware of. So we are finding in Norway, there is a national program that I may tell you more about in, in the workshop um, that addresses basic skills. And the one that is easiest to motivate people to, to ask for courses in is digital skills. But when they come to the digital skill course, we realize that they also lack literacy. And in some cases, we have announced courses as digital, knowing that it was going to be digital literacy, <laughs> that it was going to be both. And there have been, there has been some criticism that we were actually uh, giving people what they hadn't asked for, if it is what they need. So we, they, they need to be combined. And literacy and language, normally when I talk about these themes, I have to uh, argue for the fact that you don't need to have acquired a level of literacy before you start using digital tools. But I know that I don't need to do this in Germany, I hope. Two years ago, I was in Austria and I asked the room, at what level of literacy can you start using digital tools? 
and the majority of the room said that level two of the OECD, you know, PIAC and so on. Now, I hope you know that you can actually start from scratch and we are alphabetizing, we don't like the term, but we are giving initial literacy courses in Norway through computers. There is even a system, uh, a model that is becoming very well known and very successful, which is called uh, writing yourself into reading. They, they use, um, what is it called, um, synthetic sound, you know, you press a key and you hear the sound of the letter. So they, they try their way to write simple things like banana. And there is a video of a man in his 40s learning to write and learning Norwegian. And he hears b, oh, m, and then presses, yeah, and I'm done. And you hear banana and you see a smile going from, from ear to ear. It is possible, it is possible at all levels, but we need to know what we are teaching. We don't, we shouldn't make just mixing what I've heard in some French speaking countries. This person is illiterate in French. There's no such a thing. Because then I'm illiterate in Chinese and I'm not an illiterate person. So we need to identify the issues and then make sure that we give a, uh, an aggregated solution, an integrated approach. And yes, it needs to be, the digital skills need to be at the base of everything that we teach. But can we? We need to continue using our adult pedagogical uh, values that we have known about for so many years. Relevance, relevance, relevance. An adult learner doesn't want to learn something that he may need some day. And since they are not five years old, you cannot say, because. <laughs> why do I have to go to school? Because. An adult needs to know why. And that means that it the, the learning needs to be extremely relevant. And we need to find the different pedagogical approaches that will work for each individual. But that is the challenge. Why? Because I'm sorry to tell you, but I'm the first to confess that I'm not good enough in digital skills to organize digital learning for students. And I have a feeling that even though you are so advanced in Germany, it is also the case here. And I agree, the first thing that the institutions say should not be give my teachers a course. I don't believe in courses, but we do need an enormous lift of the professional development of teachers and trainers in adult learning when it comes to digital competence. To choose the adequate tool, tools, to choose the adequate platforms, if you're not as lucky as immigrant, migrant teachers are in Germany, because you do have a platform, but if you are teaching anything else, what do you choose? How do you use it? Many teachers still tell me, I don't want to be the computer room. I don't want you to be in the computer room either. For the first, can we please forget the computers? But we are always lagging behind. The world has gone away from this, this you use when you need power. But otherwise, I'm on my tablet or on my mobile. And everybody today in our countries, it will be different maybe when you hear from the UNESCO experiences in countries under development, but today everybody has a smartphone. So there is so extremely much we can do with the smartphones without going to the computer room. So, but you need to know how to use them, 
what is the safest way, what is a way that will not waste your time and will not waste the motivation of the students. One example. In Norway, one of the most innovative things we're doing now after the new immigrant wave is that we realized that we couldn't continue the model where first you have to spend two or three years learning the language, learning some basic education, and then we will try to get you employed. It pacifies everybody. So it, it wasn't working. Adults need something quicker. We are putting them as um, learners in a company or very often in municipal institutions like a hospital. They are helping in a hospital with barely this much Norwegian. And they are there maybe two or three days a week, and they are two days in the educational institution. Now, they have smartphones. They may be able to read and write, but they don't know any language but they are taught in the educational setting. They are taught how to use the phones to take videos. And they may, be, may have, um, have practiced how you say, uh, hello, did you have a nice weekend? To establish social links with the other workers. And for some reason, the other person didn't understand. Okay, wait, take the phone. Did you have a nice weekend? And the other person answers, I don't understand. They take this video with them to the learning situation. They analyze what happened, linguistic functions. They practice again. They go and repeat the next week the same situation. And now they can film it worked. It can be as simple as this. Because you're empowering the person See, I am learning now on my own. I am learning to learn. I know how to do things like that. In another occasion, in another setting, we do a lot of learning at work in Norway. It has become very popular. And one of the companies that is also a member of the BSN was in charge of a course for, because the company had bought some very expensive digital equipment and the workers didn't know how to use it. So please give my employers a course. The teacher realized that the, the workers were never going to use that at, at the place they were. Remember Vygotsky? You cannot stretch yourself too much, too much further than where you are. Start where people are. These people were not very digital in their own lives. So the, the person in charge of the course forgot for a month or so about this very expensive digital equipment that they had to learn to use and started with emails, what we call the everyday apps, uh, finding the next bus. They became more confident and then they started working with the tools. This is a vision. This teacher who found this should write a book but we don't because we are too busy. And what happens then is that the people who don't have this vision but are in charge of teaching experiences fail. So in this very rumbling exposition, if you want to keep an idea is we need more teacher training. Uh, there are so many ways of using the digital tools, or so many ways of organizing it. Personally, I love the idea of the flipped classroom, the flipped learning. Use the computers for what needs to be done that the teacher is not absolutely necessary for. So if you're learning a new language, like German, there's a lot of, I'm a language teacher originally, I know there's a lot of drill involved. And I spent, 30 years ago, spent a lot of expensive teacher time making my students repeat persons of the verb in Spanish. That can be done by the computer. 
at the understanding, the comprehension, the social environment as the teacher. So let them learn with a computer and come back to the classroom. We should be flipping a lot. But we are not, because we don't think about it and because the whole organization of the schools, of the teaching, is not based on that. We need to be flexible. But even if I agree with you that uh, the learner doesn't need to be, um, what did you say, uh, overwhelmed, I know the teachers are. The teachers are completely overwhelmed by the sheer magnitude of the choice, unless you're a lucky one who can use the platforms that you have created. But if you're teaching anything else that there isn't a good platform for, what shall I do? Now, very often, simple, best. I know of a course provider in Norway who uses Facebook for everything. The first thing they do is that if you're a teacher with them, and they are part-time teachers, it's a sort of a, um, a study association, <coughs> sorry. If you're a teacher with them, you have to be part of a closed Facebook group. And each group that is taught, each the has one closed Facebook group. So they start practicing how to share ideas with each other, sharing links, and it's extremely easy. But they do literacy training, they do literacy, media literacy training, and they get used, the teachers themselves, to how the participants will meet this. For me, it's a question now of teacher survival. We are, I think we are lagging behind dramatically. I think that many politicians are completely out of route. Uh, many at policy level think we are doing well because we have those magnificent platforms. But how are the teachers coping? I hope that your teachers are coping better than the teachers I have met in Norway. But I think we need, just because it's a survival now, it's a question of wise common decisions, like what sort of platform you can have, and extremely specialized communities of practice. There are many communities of practice now based on Facebook, should be on Nepal, I'm compelled to say that, but they are in Facebook, uh, that are so specialized that it is for alphabetization of immigrants in this particular program. But then you can ask, how are you coping with this problem? Are you using that text? What app should I use for this? And it's really peer exchange and it's really peer learning. And as policy makers, as uh, organizers, we need to make sure that there is a possibility for the teachers to have time and resources to use these communities of practice. And time, time is money. And very often we give money without giving time. The teachers need the time and the motivation to really exchange experiences to be able to put in practice this fantastic view of the digital learning that we we all have so we are facing a challenge because we still haven't gone out of the age of computerization we are now in the digital and it's easy to think that there is a generational gap that of course uh, dinosaurs like me are not as used to all this. We have had to learn it ourselves and so on. But actually, I've been told that the people that come, the young people who come out of teacher training now in Norway are already lagging behind. Because not even the training is really state of the art. So we are never going to achieve what we can achieve with these wonderful tools 
unless the teachers and the trainers are really up to it. And that means being much more than at the level of digital functionality. You need to have everything that is digital skills so much under your skin that you can cope with problems. I won't mention what type of problems we've talked about. So I'm very happy today to have heard already several times the word didactics. There are many countries in Europe, when, when I work in the network, I see that they're not thinking about the didactics involved in digital tools. And to me, it's, it's central. You need to choose when you're going to use the computer or the, the tablet or not. You need to choose when. You need to know why, <laughs> because very often we don't. So the way ahead for me is a much clearer governance. Too many countries are leaving this to happen and stakeholder cooperation, and we are stakeholders as teachers also. Funding needs to be there, but it needs to be funding for time also, and continuous professional development needs to be established as the base for everything that happens. We need to cooperate with the ICT industry, and it, very especially with app creators. There are so few apps that really are adapted to adult learning. You know that because you have created a platform to cope with that and constant evaluation and transformation. I know I've just been rambling about the things I believe in, but uh, we will be working in this capacity building series that I told you about. We will be working on digital tools and learning uh, next year. So any input you have, or if you want to ask questions about Norway or about countries that are in the network, write to me, please. Thank you. Gibt es Fragen? Vielen Dank. Fragen, Anmerkungen, die auf Deutsch gestellt werden können. Thank you very much for the, your contribution. I, I really still wonder, uh, your, your point was really very strong that the teachers don't have the competences, uh, the, the necessary competences. And I, I'm really wondering if, if that really how far this is true. Uh, I mean, we, we use digital technology in everyday life. We do use them, and, and the teachers also, they, they use them in everyday life. They, they are able to use digital technology to, to do anything they want to do in their, in their time. But why would you think, uh, is there such a big gap when they, our teachers and, and try to prepare a course or deliver a course? Why do you think this is such a big gap? Well, I've been looking, and I, I have it in my slides for the workshop, I've been looking at what the Norwegian framework for basic skills has at level three, which is supposed to be when you really are functional, what you can do as a functional a user of digital tools at level three. And going through that, I've been working with computers since before the World Wide Web. I'm not sure I can do all that. I'm not sure I am functionally at level three in digital tools. But it's also that, again, the joke with things can go wrong. Unless you are, yes, yes, I can write emails, but I have changed my computer to a Mac and they changed, was, was, it that, was that because changing to Mac? Well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I share the applause yet. I'm fighting the Mac. I'm alone at home. I'm a, I'm a fake retired person. I work from home now. I used to have a whole ICT uh, team. And suddenly, my, my, my Mac had been 
communicating with the printer. But suddenly there was an update and it refused to. So I couldn't write and I was screaming at home because I didn't have the ICT team there lay, lay, any longer. And I think that's where many of us are. Yes, we do use the tools, but really competent and confident, no. And the problem is that getting at that level is only two thirds of the way. The part that is lacking is knowing so much about the existing tools, about how they work, how they are, how reliable, that you can make informed choices for when and how you use them. And that's the didactic part. And there's too little of that. I have been browsing the web looking for how-tos in this area extremely few. What you get is big courses that you have to go to, even though they are maybe uh, half a distance and so on, you can take a whole course of a semester university on the use of digital tools. Most teachers don't have time for that. But there are very few, how can you use this particular tool and why and where are the contents that you can share with your students, we aren't there yet. We haven't really organized ourselves, is my contention. I don't have research, I have impressions. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, the last thing you said, I think this is a very important one that we don't know a lot about the didactics and um, we I think it's not the important thing whether we know something about the technical stuff or not. Um, the problem is that uh, um, we have to know how it works. And there are several things that um, are important to um, consider. Um, at the one hand, of course, we have the heterogeneous um, learners. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. Um, but I think um, from the um, perspective of the teacher, a very, very big problem is that um, the funding of the courses um, doesn't um, legitimate, legitimate mm -hmm. um, the funding of um, learning of the teachers. So they don't have any possibilities to practice, to learn um, how to um, yep. work with the digital stuff. Yep. And that is, I think that is a very, very important thing we have to solve in the future. And thank you for asking that because you have something I had meant to say and I forgot. I don't believe in courses. You, you said. <laughs> yeah, I said. You, you did. I, I mean, I have gone, because I was part of the leadership in the institution I worked for, we all had to go to a course on a financial, new financial system. And we went for two days to a place where a technical person explained to us all the functions of this software. The day after, I tried to use it and couldn't remember a thing. It's silly. We have wasted an enormous amount of money on courses. Teachers don't have time and there is not money. But sometimes in, in the normal school, and in the standard school system for, for kids in Norway, they decided to uh, use a platform for all communication between teachers and students and among teachers and everything. So all teachers were sent to courses. Once a week, the only thing that really worked was the interaction between teachers, the peer learning. So I think that what we need to invest money on is video courses, YouTube type, how to, that show you, pam, 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 this is what you can do with this application, have a collection of those, and in online communities of practice, exchange experiences, exchange materials that have been created with those apps, and very specifically, that's why I said we need to be specialized, very specifically for your subject matter, your target group, your type of provision, whether it's uh, everyday courses or once a week with online, specific. If you are in this situation, this is what you can do. 
And now that we have the possibility of communicating across Germany, why don't we? This is a uh, job for you. One question. Okay, um, you had a best practice example of a school using Facebook groups for um, <laughs> organizational purposes. And uh, that's when um, a thing came to my mind. I just like to know what role do you think um, should personal, uh, should commercial social media platforms like Facebook play in the uh, educational system with maybe the uh, view to the security of your data? Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, uh, what they placed in Facebook was the communication. Uh, it, it wasn't really hard data, but it, and it was a closed group, but it's a very, very valid objection. I mentioned it only in the sense that sometimes simple is best. But obviously, we, we would like to have uh, that type of platform for the whole adult education sector. Just to say that that is what the European Commission has tried to do with the PALE. It is too wide. It is too big. I would like to have rather block platforms in, in terms of real teacher interaction. I don't know what to say about uh, commercial. It, this is expensive. It, there's always going to be a commercial interest behind the platforms unless the government has paid for them. I have just learned that Google has introduced now a new system where you can mm, you can see the impact of the sort of preferences you have for your individual safety. So you can see who is seeing your data. They, they, I think they are waking up to our, to our concerns. So there will always be a balance between the fact that they are commercial and don't care so much and want to try to sell our information uh, and the fact that if they are going to have users, Facebook is losing them. So they, they will have to wake up. If you are, oh, yeah, yeah, I have, I have also, yeah, I have also read, if you're not paying for the product, the product is you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, it, but you know, that is the sort of discussion we need to have. That is the sort of discussion we need to have with politicians also, which in some cases means that the government establishes a platform they secure themselves. Is it going to be secure? There are hackers everywhere. We'll need to live with it. Sorry, I don't have the solution. The solution is the HS cloud, but we can continue this quick. <laughs> Thank you, Graciela, for your inspiring talk and um